Good morning, everyone. Today we're joined by Sarah Stewart Johnson, Associate Professor of Planetary Science in our Department of Biology. And she's also part of our Science, Technology, and International Affairs Program, STIA, in the School of Foreign Service. And she runs the Johnson Biosignatures Lab. And she joined our faculty about five years ago and is also a visiting scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. So Sarah, Sarah, thank you for joining us for this conversation this morning. And to begin, can you tell us a bit about your field of planetary science and how you got involved in this area of study? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so planetary science, it's this interdisciplinary field that combines things like physics and geology and geochemistry and chemistry, all of these things together. Um, and it's a little bit different from astronomy, you know, which has been around for centuries. In many ways, planetary science is still an emerging field. It's, it's really come into its own since the dawn of the space age, when we've really come to understand these other planets as worlds, which we can explore. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm a planetary scientist. I, um, I sort of got into that. I met some planetary scientists when I was in college and just got really excited about this idea of pursuing this field. Oh, that's great. Now, your research focuses on detecting and decoding biosignatures, traces of life. Can you share with us a little bit about biosignatures and what are they? How do, how do they relate to the search for life and the exploration of other planets? Sure. So biosignatures, that's what you said exactly. Traces of life or, or fingerprints of life. You know, these can be chemicals, elements, you know, certain types of isotopes or minerals, even textures that are serving as evidence of past or present life. And, and we look for them out in planetary environments as astrobiologists. We think about concepts and build instruments to go off and explore these other places. And I'm particularly um, part of, I guess, the in-situ exploration community. So things that can actually touch down and scour the surfaces of these, these other planets and moons and, and try to find this evidence for life. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, tell us about the work of your lab. <laughs> What are some of the different sites where you've been able to pursue field work? And can you describe some of your, your more recent projects? Yes. Um, so the lab, it's got these two components of it, really. There's one side of the lab that's really focused on organic geochemistry, and there's another side that's focused on molecular biology. Um, and so the lab, you know, it's really focused on a lot of things related to the search for life in astrobiology. So some of it is, you know, interpreting data from current spacecraft and thinking about approaches that we could use on future instruments. But one of the, the most fun things that we get to do is, is to go out into these places that we call analog environments. So, you know, these often inaccessible parts of our own biosphere that share relevant similarities to these other planetary bodies, like say the surface of Mars. And so we, we go off and we really are trying to learn how to, to look, to take these tools and techniques and make sure we understand how to use them because we can't find life here you know, on our own planet. How are we gonna do it out in space? And so we, we go and, and dig around and some of these places are really otherworldly. Some of the most beautiful places I've ever been, places like the Australian Outback or the Atacama Desert or the dry valleys of Antarctica. Um, and so we've got lots of projects going on. My students are racking up a lot of frequent flyer miles under sort of normal circumstances right. like during the Georgetown travel ban. But, um, but that's, that's one of the things that, that we really like doing. But we do have some things that are a bit more theoretical. I'd say my favorite project that we're working on right now in the lab is this idea of looking for biosignatures that we've been calling agnostic biosignatures or types of signs of life that don't necessarily um, presuppose a particular underlying biochemistry or particular molecular framework. Things that, you know, might not even be carbon based that aren't necessarily like life as we know it. Wow, wow, thank you, thank you. 
Now let's turn to your recent book, Sirens of Mars, Searching for Life on Another World. It was published earlier this year and was recently selected by the New York Times as one of the 100 notable books of 2020. In the book, you explore both the history of Mars exploration and how our scientific understanding of Mars has evolved over the course of your own career. What are some of the most important insights that have emerged for you and that you hope to share with your readers of the book? Uh, so the book, the book, I guess it's really meant to help people appreciate science and scientific inquiry and, and to really understand that the study of Mars is a beautiful thing. Like here I am in this discipline where, you know, just a hundred years ago, like we had no idea what this planet was. And now we intimately know like all of these details. And the book is really trying to explain how that's come to be and how we have come to like have this very intimate understanding of this other place that's every bit as complex and vibrant and interesting as our own earth. Um, so the book is about science, but it's also about our, our human relationship to this planet. And, and, and I guess one of the main takeaways is the more we study the science, it's like the more profundity there is. Like it's allowing us to ask these really deep questions. You know, some of the deepest questions that we can ask things like, you know, who are we and where did we come from? And why is there something and not nothing? And did that something from nothing, did it happen once? Did it happen time and again? And, and are we alone? Like in this huge wide cosmos, are we alone? Oh, thank you, thank you. Now, one of the courses you're teaching this semester focuses on current topics in astrobiology and planetary sciences, provides opportunities for graduate students to present their own research. Can you talk about how the course operates and your approach to working with and mentoring students? Sure. Um, oh, it's been great fun. It's been great fun. So we get together and part of the course is, uh, is reading papers, you know, papers that are just hot off the presses. And we get together and we just excavate the data sets and we talk about the ideas. I mean, these, you know, some of the most exciting emerging ideas in the field and and often you know just we'll be picking it and it'll lead to more questions and so we'll go find more papers and more papers and we just sort of walk our way through this just really exciting intellectual realm it's 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 been really great and then there's another part of it where the graduate students get to present their own research and um and it's 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 just lovely they get up and they talk about you know where they are their most exciting recent results and we can give feedback and suggestions and we can kind of workshop all of these ideas together and uh and it's astonishing like i find that i am learning so much from my students every every time we get together it's really it's really been fun that's great um i can't thank you enough for, <laughs> for all that you do for georgetown um i want to congratulate you on on the book in closing is there a message that you'd like to share with our university community Oh, yeah, so I think that, um, you know, this is a really tricky time that we're all in. And, and I remember in these very early days of the pandemic, I, I just spent all of my time just wishing we could just have a return to normal, you know, that we could be back in the classroom and that I could hug my friends and I could go walk down the sort of bustling street or grab a meal in a restaurant, you know, these sorts of things that were just kind of the pattern of our everyday life. Um, but, you know, sometime about midway through the pandemic, I happened to, so far, you know, I happened to read this essay that Arne Dr. Roy had written and it was called Pandemic as Portal. It's just a beautiful, beautiful essay. But one of the things that she emphasizes in there is that a return to normal is actually, you know, she questions, is that really what we want? And is that really the best outcome? And, and I've spent a lot of time kind of sitting with that idea, you know, and maybe it's not a return to normal, but something much better that we want. And she talks about how pandemics can be these portals, you know, how it can be a gateway to a new world, a world that we can 
re-envision. Um, and, you know, like there's been nothing good about this pandemic, but maybe some good things could come out of how we build back and, and we'll have that chance, you know, like we have a, a dark winter ahead and, and you know, it's, there's so much suffering going on and we're going to have to really pull together to get through this, you know, period of intense isolation, but there is hope at the end of the tunnel. I mean, there are these vaccines and I just, I still just can't believe, you know, these little pieces of messenger RNA are going to tell ourselves to make a protein that's going to trigger an immune response that's going to protect us and so there's a light at the end of the tunnel but just trying to think about how as we walk through this kind of gateway and we build back I just think it's so important to look at this as an as an opportunity to just make a world that's has less suffering and it's more just and more humane and and more sustainable for all of us thank you Thank you. And thank you for taking this time to be with us today. And I look forward to being with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you for every Hoya everywhere.